Hi guys, welcome to today's video. This is 2019 Paper 1, Question 5. Uh, it's going to really illustrate the relationship between complex numbers and also quadratic equations, and there's going to be some practice with De Moivre's theorem. So let's get into the video. Okay, so here's our question. Uh, we're told that 3 plus 2i is a root of this quadratic. Our p and q are real numbers. We've got to find the value of p and find the value of q. Okay, so basically we're given two unknowns in our quadratic, the coefficient of z to the power of 1 and also the constant. So we know 3 plus 2i is a root. Uh, but we also know because of this that uh, 3 minus 2i is also a root. Uh, because that's the conjugate of 3 plus 2i. And that's actually a theorem which states that if a plus bi is a root, then a minus bi is also a root. And that's called the conjugate root theorem. You don't need to know the name for it, you just need to know how to use it. So now we have two roots. So now that we have two roots, uh, there's a couple of different ways we can proceed. Uh, one way would be to write down the minus b formula and work backwards. So we could use this formula to work backwards, just subbing in uh, p for b and q for c, and we know a is equal to 1, and we can turn this into an equation with our roots. Uh, but I think that way is a bit complicated, so we're just going to look for a different way. So another way of approaching this question is by saying that because x squared minus the sum of the roots times x plus the product of the roots times 0 uh, is true for any quadratic, we can say that p is equal to m minus everything in this bracket, and q is equal to uh, the product of the roots, which is 3 plus 2i uh, times 3 minus 2i. Uh, so p will simplify to uh, minus 6, because we know for any two uh, conjugates that a plus bi times a minus bi is equal to a squared plus b squared, where a is the real component and b is the uh, number in front of i, q is then 3 squared plus 2 squared, which is 13. So that's a very fast way of finding p and q and it definitely awards a good knowledge of how quadratics work. So we'll call that method uh, the sum of the roots and product of the roots method. But there's actually a third way, and that's to turn our roots into factors of the quadratic and then multiply them out. So we could just let this equal to 0 because we know that if x is equal to a is a root, then x minus a is a factor. So because our two roots are z is equal to 3 plus 2i, and also its conjugate z is equal to 3 minus 2i, uh, we can just formulate this equation based on that. So that just simplifies uh, to this line, and then we just need to multiply in our brackets, uh, like so, and when you multiply z into everything in here, uh, minus 3 into everything in here as well, and also with minus 2i over here, what we are left with is all of this, which we can now cancel down just by, you know, adding like terms and changing some things, we'll get into that now. So uh, z squared is the only z squared involved, so we're just going to write that out again. We have minus 3z, minus 3z again, which will give us minus 6z. We have a plus 2zi and a minus 2zi, so those terms are just going to cancel out. We also have a minus 6i and a plus 6i, so those will also cancel. And lastly, we have a plus 9 and a minus 4i squared. And we know minus 4i squared is equal to minus 4 times minus 1 because i squared is equal to minus 1. And therefore, minus 4i squared is just equal to 4. So therefore, we have a 9 plus 4 which will give us a plus 13, and that's all equal to 0 as well. But we know the coefficient of z is p, and we know the constant is q. So therefore we know p is equal to minus 6, which is the coefficient of z, and q is equal to 13, because that's the constant. So that's our third way of getting what we want. We're going to call that the roots to factors method. And it just goes to show how many ways there are of approaching some problems. I'm sure there's another couple of ways of doing this uh, that you can think of. Well, that will get you the right answer, and if they work, then by all means do use them. Uh, but I hope you found this helpful. And uh, part A, regardless of how you did it, is going to get you uh, 10 marks, which is quite nice, especially if you did it way number 2, because it would have been very quick, but uh, 10 marks regardless. So B part 1 asks us, given that V is equal to 2 minus 2 root 3 I, to write V in the form R cos theta plus I sine theta, our r is a real number, and theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, so this r cos theta plus i sine theta form is known as polar form. So currently v is in rectangular form, but we've got to convert it to polar form. And uh, the steps to do this are, first you find r, the modulus of 
v. And secondly, to find theta, the argument of v. And lastly, just to write this in polar form, uh, because that's what we're asked to do. So here I've just drawn our real and imaginary axis. And we're also just going to label our axis with some values. So given that v is equal to 2 minus 2 root 3i, we're just going to get 2, two root 3 in the calculator to help us sketch this. So uh, roughly 3.46, which means that v will be about here on our argon diagram. And the modulus is just going to be the length of v from the origin just to this point here in absolute terms. So to, to find that, we can obviously use Pythagoras' theorem because this is just really a triangle. So the modulus of v, which we said we were going to call r, is equal to the square root of 2 squared plus uh, minus 2 root 3 all to be squared, which when uh, we put into our calculator is going to be equal to just 4. So r is equal to 4. And you could choose to simplify this a little bit before, if you want to before putting in the calculator, but I'm trying to show you how to, how to do it each time uh, regardless of which numbers you're given. So we found the modulus, and next we're going to have to find the argument, which is the angle v makes with the positive sense of the x-axis, or this angle here. So basically from wherever v is around to uh, this side of the x-axis over here on the right. And we're going to call that angle theta. And I think the easiest way to find theta is to just is to first of all just draw another small angle uh, in here, which we can find using our triangle. And we're going to call that angle alpha. So we know that tan alpha is equal to the opposite over the adjacent in our right angle triangle, uh, where the opposite is equal to the imaginary component, or at least its length, which is 2 root 3, uh, over the real component, whose length is 2, uh, which is the same as the right over the run, by the way, which means that tan alpha is equal to root 3, so therefore alpha is equal to the tan inverse of root 3 and we can see that the tan inverse of root 3 is equal to 60 degrees on our, on our calculator. So that's the value of alpha but we've designed alpha to be equal to 360 minus theta because the alpha and theta form a full circle. So if 360 minus theta is equal to 60 degrees that means theta is equal to 300 degrees. So now because you found uh, r which is equal to 4 and theta to be equal to 300 we can now write v as 4 times cos 300 plus i sine 300. And that is now in polar form, which means that we've completed b part 1. And for finding v in polar form, you're going to get 5 marks, which doesn't really seem like a lot, but uh, that's just what it happens to be in this case. And b part 2 asks us to use our answer above to find two possible values of w, where w squared is equal to v. And we've got to give our answers in the form a plus ib, where mb are real numbers. So they're asking us to use this, so we're just going to rewrite that. So we have v in polar form, and we also know that v is equal to w squared, which means that w is equal to the square root of v, or v to the power of a half. But the trick is here to realize that because they're looking for two possible values, we're actually going to have plus or minus v to the power of a half. So we do this in order to find both possible values, as opposed to just a positive one. So every time you're dealing with complex numbers and something to do with indices comes up, so you're putting a complex number to the power of anything really, you can use De Moivre's theorem, which is which is in the log tables. So here is De Moivre's theorem. You won't actually have to remember it, uh, although it is pretty easy to remember, I would say. So given that, we can now use that to find v to the power of a half and then make it either negative or positive. So w is equal to the pos positive or negative value of 4 to the, to the power of a half times cos 300 over 2 plus i sine 300 over 2. So we're going to call w1 uh, for the first value of w, 2, which is the root of, square root of 4, cos 150 uh, plus i sine 150, and w2, which is, which is the negative case, uh, minus 2 cos 150 plus i sine 150. So now we're just going to simplify that. It can be done very easy, easily on the calculator. Just plug in 2 cos 150, and the value will be minus root 3. Do the same thing for i and you're going to get plus i. And you can also very easily do the same thing uh, for w2, just watching out for the uh, minus sign. But that will equal root 3 minus i. So now we're just going to check that it's in the form that they want it to be in. So we have a, which is any real number. And of course, both minus root 3 and plus root 3 are real numbers, although they happen to be irrational. And ib, so i times some number b, and b is actually there, it's just equal to 1. And of course, we're going to have to write that. Therefore, it's in the form they wanted it to be in, and that means that's it for this question.
And for getting all of this out, you're going to get 10 marks. Standard use of De Moivre's theorem here, nothing too complicated. And uh, that's it for this question. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. If you did, there's going to be other similar videos in the description to help you brush up on your complex numbers. And I'll see you next time.